Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we pray that your presence is with us as we study your word, go over these stories and understand how they relate to our life and how we are supposed to behave and, and how you're calling us to live uh, different lives. Lord, we pray for revival in our church, Lord, that your spirit rains down in each one of our hearts, that we obey you and love you and understand how much you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, sorry, I have to hold it. He says this, and this is from Matthew 6. What shall we eat or what shall we drink? Do not worry. Or what shall we wear? Do not worry about these things. <clears throat> For the pagans run after these things. Or in our modern day, we could say people who don't believe in God. Secular people run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Have you ever gotten into a spiral of worrying about what is to come? It can really spiral out of control, can it? Because we want to, or some of us, let me rephrase that, some of us want to control our lives and have control over what's happening. And so... We think, okay, we'll control this, we'll control that. But then when we really stop and think of it, how much control do we have? Well, we think, okay, this is a secure investment, right? I'm going to invest here so my money will be safe, and when I need it, it'll be there. And then we've got banking issues that make us nervous, right? That just, that's been in the news recently. Some banks are having problems. That makes us nervous, right? And we think, well, maybe we should take our money out of the bank, right? Or, but then all well, we've got inflation, and then so then the, the, then the cash sitting underneath the mattress isn't worth as much as it used to be either. Okay, well, maybe I'll invest in real estate. Well, then we have a real estate bubble, right? And things burst, and okay, well, maybe I'll invest in the stock market. Well, then that goes up, and it goes down, and it goes up, and it goes down. Okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll buy gold. That'll be safe, right? Well... Gold goes up and down, too. So it's difficult sometimes if we think about how am I going to protect my family and make sure we, have, we can afford our home, we can afford our car, we can afford our food and our clothes. In this scripture, it only mentions food and clothing, right? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Those are very basic necessities. Clothing for warmth, right? and food and drink for basic survival. They're, they're things that they worried about were less because they had less, unfortunately. Famine was common in Bible times. People did starve, so it was a real concern. Famine is common in our world still today, our modern world, just not in America yet. So... But there are people right now very, very hungry across the globe. So when Jesus says, do not think about what we shall eat or drink, it's a very real thing to them. Maybe not as much for us. It's probably been at least a good two generations for most people since their family was hungry. Maybe less, I don't know. But there are people today that are still hungry. They do have welfare in this country. I'm referencing more outside the United States. The UN estimates anywhere between 800 million to a billion people are on the edge of starvation worldwide. Most of them are in what we would call Asia, the Asian territories, some also in Africa. Very poor, living on the cusp of starvation and malnourishment. So it's not that easy just to say, ah, well, you know, whatever. My girls will have food, right? No biggie. 
this little bank kerfuffle, you know, if all my accounts went away yesterday, I'll be fine. They'll have food, right? No, it's a real concern. But Jesus tells us where our focus needs to be in that scripture. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So in this lesson, we're dealing with the tension between providing for our family, providing for ourselves, a home or a roof of some sort, whether it's a townhouse, a condo, an apartment, some form of shelter, a mobile home, even an RV, something to put over our, our family's heads or our, our own heads, clothes, food, dealing with that tension of working for that, working hard to produce that, and putting God first. And he brings up some unique stories, and we're going to have to go fast through these stories because the pages were stacking up as I was preparing this lesson, so we're going to really have to zip through. So I'm not going to ask you to trust me on these stories, but I am going to tell them without necessarily reading them because we don't have time. But the lesson has most of these stories mentioned, and I will reference the scriptures so you can go back and do your Berean duty and fact check me. Or maybe you've already read and you've already fact checked me, which would be great. The first story deals with Jehoshaphat, one of the kings of Judah. He is a, what we would call, good king, an obedient king to God. But he isn't perfect, makes a few mistakes, and we're going to look at that. Now, the passage from the lesson is 2 Chronicles 20, but we're going to go a little before that and set up the scene about Jehoshaphat. He follows his father, Asa, who was also a devout follower of God and a good king. And so we can see, train a child up in the way they shall go, right? He got his training from his father, and he follows his father's example. And so he doesn't just sit around, though, and expect God to just rain blessings continuously from heaven, although God does. He works to the best of his ability to protect what God has given him to control. So in 2 Chronicles 17, it tells us he fortifies the cities of Judah. He raises a standing army and puts garrisons in all these towns and cities to protect them. And he also sets up a system of judges so the people had justice, fair judges. And he specifically warns them, and I'm summarizing again from scripture, about bribery. No bribery, all right? That I'm expecting you to be fair judges. And he sets up what Mrs. White would call uh, the Supreme Court. If something happens and one of these judges can't handle it, they take it to the priestly family in Jerusalem to help sort it out. There was also another elder as well. There was the priest and an elder that both handled more of this Supreme Court that he set up. And, it, and in early in his reign, in 2 Chronicles 17.3, it says this, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because in his early years he walked in the ways his father David had followed. He did not consult Baals, but sought the God of his father, followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. Okay, the kingdom of the north, the kingdom of Israel, had Ahab during part of Jehoshaphat's reign doing his wild stuff. The Lord established the kingdom under his control, and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat, so that he had great wealth and honor. Skipping down a few verses, the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land surrounding Judah, so they did not make war with Jehoshaphat. He fortified his territory. He put garrisons, but God blessed him. Nobody wanted to attack Judah, and it seems like in Bible times, it was like every year we attacked each other or figured out who was weak that we could take something from, and we'll attack them, and then if we get weak, then they attack us. They're always attacking each other. So Jehoshaphat becomes more and more powerful. He built forts and store cities in Judah, again summarizing from chapter 17. And he also ex he, he kept experienced fighting men in Jerusalem, a standing army, which wasn't always the norm back in those days. 
But the trouble begins in chapter 18. Now Jehoshaphat had great wealth and honor, and he allied himself with Ahab, king of Israel, by marriage. And you think, well, what's the big deal? Keep it in the family. Israel was one of the 12 tribes, right? Keep everything in the family. Let's work together. Let's bring the kingdoms back together. However, God was not happy with this union, and you'll find out why. And Mrs. White elucidates what the Bible just says, allied himself by marriage. It doesn't say he married somebody. And Mrs. White tells us, in fact, it was his son that he married to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Well, we all know Jezebel, right? Nobody names their daughters Jezebel anymore, and there's a good reason. Right? And her daughter was, well, I don't know if she matched her mother in wickedness, but she was really close. And I might be mispronouncing her name, but Athalia, if I'm saying that right, marries Jehoshaphat's son. And the reason why God is so upset about this will become clear because the misery it caused Judah by this one marriage is unbelievable. So this marriage happens and it's like this invisible bubble of protection. There's a little pinprick in it now. And the air begins to let out of this bubble of protection over Judah. And, and Jehoshaphat knows that something is coming because he made a mistake. A prophet tells him this in chapter 19. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? This is after he went to battle with Ahab, even though God told him not to. So he'd allied himself through marriage. His son and Ahab's daughter had, had married. And now he felt obligated to go visit. He visits. Then he feels obligated to fight with Ahab, even though a prophet... And this prophet is hilarious, if you get a chance to read this story. He must have been sarcastic because Ahab knows, okay, this guy's really a prophet from God. All these other people are just my paid prophets, but this guy really is. And so he says, okay, come tell me. Sorry, I'm telling you the story. I can't help it. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, you'll be great. You'll have great success. You know? And he's like, Ahab looks at him and says, how many times do I have to tell you to tell me the truth? How many prophets do you know that are sarcastic? But apparently this guy was. You'll be great. Woo! And then he actually tells him what God said, which of course was not good. But Jehoshaphat felt bound by his word and still fought with Ahab, and it didn't go well, and God was not happy. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. There is, however, some good in you, for you have rid the land of the Asherah poles and have set your heart on seeking God, and he continues to seek God, but this little seed of trouble was planted in Judah with disastrous results. And so because of this, this protective shield that everybody was too afraid to attack Jehoshaphat goes away. And then we get to the story from the lesson, 2 Chronicles 20. And again, I'm trying to go fast because we got a lot of stories. The Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Minuites come to make war on Jehoshaphat. And they say, the army is coming against you. And it's huge. Massive army. Three different kingdoms joined together to take what Judah had. Because why? Jehoshaphat had been blessed by God. He was wealthy and powerful, and they came for what he had. Jehoshaphat, as you already know, has prepared to protect his financial nest egg, right? To bring it into our, because none of us have armies. But he had... He had soldiers and forts and, and garrisons to protect the wealth that God had given him, just like we diversify our investments to protect the wealth God has given us. And then this massive army comes. And he knows he's in serious, serious trouble. And to Jehoshaphat's credit, he does what he should do in this time of trouble. He turns to the Lord. He proclaims a fast for all of Judah and the people of Judah come together to seek the Lord in prayer. And he stands up, the king stands up and prays. And he references his ancestor Solomon. And the prayer at the dedication of the temple. <clears throat> and then he references that 
Power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. And he said, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. What's the famous prayer verse, Second Chronicles 7, 14? Does that sound right? If my people who are called by my name. That's Solomon, his father, dedicating the temple, or not father, but ancestor, great, great, I don't know how many greats, grandfather, dedicating the temple. And so he's referencing that. We're crying out to you. We're referencing the dedication of the temple when the spirit of the Lord descended and it glowed like the sun and nobody could go in it. We're referencing that promise. In prayer, we're claiming your promise. This vast army is coming for us, and we know that you will hear and save us, he proclaims in faith. And a prophet stands up. Uh, further, sorry, in verse 12, he says, We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. He recognizes their weakness as a kingdom and puts it in God's hands. The protection of your people. You gave us this land. You gave us this land we inherited here, and now they're coming to take it from us. They're disobeying you because you spared them, right? The Ammonites and the Moabites, the Israelites were not allowed to kill them. And they're disobeying you, God, and trying to take this land you gave us. And then a prophet stands up and tells him, Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow march down against them. And God even tells them exactly where they're going to be. And then it says in verse 17, You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. They still have to face the army. They still have to go out in faith. But God is promising that he will fight the battle. Jehoshaphat takes his army. And they head out. And then he tells them in verse 20, People of Judah and Jerusalem, have faith in the Lord your God. You will uphold faith in his prophets and you will be successful. After consulting with them, they begin to sing. And they appoint men to sing. And maybe the whole army sang too. At least it says here, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And as they begin to sing, what happens? The armies of these three different kingdoms that probably didn't trust each other much anyways begin to fight. Ammon and Moab attack Edom and then once they're done with Edom they attack each other or Mount Seir. And so the fighting continues and goes on. The army of Judah marching forward Maybe they got to see some of it, maybe they didn't. But when they finally got there close enough to really see, all that was left were dead bodies. God's victory over their enemy. And it took them three days to collect all the plunder from this massive army. Swords and armor and money and gold and clothing. God had worked the victory. And then that shield of bubble that was pricked, right? Because we know in 2 Chronicles 17, Joseph had had that shield. And then it went away all of a sudden with this mighty army. But how Jehoshaphat responded to trouble, to the crisis for his kingdom, restored that protective bubble, right? If you were a warlike neighbor, and you just watched three of your neighbors attack each other and kill each other because Judah's God intervened, I don't think you would be real eager to fight Judah either. And so the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for God had given him rest on every side. These kingdoms were constantly fighting each other. But when Jehoshaphat, in the eyes of the secular person, doesn't have to lift a finger, even though he did, right? He prayed and humbled himself before God. It scared them to death. But that one 
marriage creates problems moving forward. Jehoshaphat, as much as he loved God and obeyed God, that mistake would echo through his family. It's almost like God created this crisis situation with these three armies to bring a preventative revival because he knew what was coming from that marriage. We think, well, what's the big deal? One kid gets married to this crazy lady. Oh, she was crazy. Jehoshaphat's son, when he comes to the throne, kills all of his brothers to establish his throne. He loses a good portion of the kingdom that his father had built up as far as the wealth. He lost some territory, too. They were invaded and defeated time and time again, all influenced by his wife. He did not follow God, but followed the ways of his wife and the wickedness of Jezebel. His son ascends to the throne, also doesn't do very well and dies within a year. Once the grandson dies, grandma now, remember Jezebel's daughter is now grandma, decides it would be a good idea to kill the rest of the family. That means grandkids, probably some children in there too, I don't know. So she can rule. And as you know the story, Joash, King Joash, escapes her evil reign simply because one of her daughters thinks mom's crazy and saves one of the one of the children with the high priest and she was married to a priest so you can probably imagine she was a follower of god this daughter one marriage Thousands of people suffered and died. Starvation, violence. Jehoshaphat's family now filled with violence as this daughter-in-law kills his grandkids and some of his own children. You can understand why God was a little distressed about this marriage. Anyways, Jehoshaphat was a king that loved the Lord, but he did make mistakes. He was not perfect. But I think the lesson for us there is, as much as we do to protect what God has blessed us with, in the end, we have to hold it up for him and say, you have to protect this. You have to take care of this. That's what Jehoshaphat did. He built forts. He built an army. He had a standing army. But it wasn't enough to protect what he had. He had to give it to God. We see a similar message presented in 1 Samuel 14. Jonathan, the son of Saul, has to make a similar choice, right? This is a different story. This is earlier times, before King Solomon, before Jehoshaphat. The Philistines, the five main cities of the Philistines were a loose confederacy, but they were strong and powerful, and they were dominating Israel. The Israelites come up to fight them, but the, the Philistine army was massive, and it scared them to death, and they fled. And Saul was left with 600 men. That's all the resources he had left to fight this massive army spread across the land. Jonathan, his son decides one day, let's go for a walk. Let's head over to the Philistine outpost and see what God has in store. Two men, him and his armor bearer, against this massive army. Now Jonathan, being a prince, a wealthy man himself, I'm sure at this point, could have hid with his wealth somewhere to protect himself. <clears throat> but Jonathan is laying his life on the line for his faith in God. And he says this to his armor bearer. This is 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. Come, let's go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised fellows. 
Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few, which is an amazing statement of faith, right? He's saying, the two of us can handle this. Let's go over. His armor bearer was clearly a believer in God, too, because he says, do what, do what you think is best. I'm with you all the way, which he had to be because they were risking their lives. Then Jonathan says this, come, we will cross over toward the men and let them see us. If they say, wait there until we come to you, we will stare where we are and not go up to them. <clears throat> but if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because then that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. It almost feels like Jonathan is, is ready today to, to do what he's going to do, whether, whatever the outcome Live or die, but today is going to be the day, right? Because he doesn't say, if they say, you know, if they tell us, oh, we're, wait there, we'll come to you. He doesn't say, well, then God said no, and we're heading back to camp. He's, he's just going to stay there and still fight them, which would probably have been a losing battle. But then he said, if they say, come up to us, then we know God has given them into our hands. So one way or another, Jonathan wants to fight today. Well, as I'm sure hopefully you, you've read this story in the past, but they call them up. Jonathan and his armor bearer climb up the cliff hand over hand. They get it to the top. Why they weren't killed as they were coming up, nobody knows. But they get to the top and they kill about 20 of them in about a half acre. And then God, once again, just like in the story of Jehoshaphat, right, where they're fighting each other, all of a sudden, panic hits the Philistines. Two crazy people trusting in God start a panic and they begin to fight each other now this isn't two different nationalities now this is Philistines fighting each other and they begin to attack each other and the army melts away in all directions Saul and his 600 men look up this army posted everywhere with their little garrisons begins to melt away and fade and retreat and fight each other and it's a total rout for the Philistines. Jonathan put it all on the line for God. And that is scary. Is it not? All on the line. Live or die, Jonathan put it all on the line for God that day. All his wealth, whatever he had, he may have even already been married at that time, might have had kids, we don't know. Or I don't know, maybe you know. <laughs> but he put it all on the line for God. Pretty scary. But God worked a miracle, and God works those kind of miracles time and time again for Israel. The Philistines come up to attack Samuel at another time, right? But they're having a revival, and God says, don't interrupt the revival, you naughty Philistines. And they are attacked by God and lightning and flee in terror. God is powerful, but he's asking his people to put them first, above their wealth and even above their families. A reverse story that is sad is... In 1 Chronicles 21, David, and I know I'm going fast through these stories, but whew, we got a lot of pages to do today. <laughs> David chooses to do a census. And you think to yourself, well, what's the big deal about a census? We have one every 10 years in America, right? Every 10 years, they send you a form, or if, if you don't answer, I think they come to the door, too with a form. <coughs> but God didn't want them to do a census. And the motives behind this census aren't immediately revealed in Scripture, but Mrs. White brings it out that David, after the trouble with Absalom, was looking to expand the kingdom. He wanted to attack some other nations. They were strong, they were powerful, and he wanted to exert his influence, and he wanted all men of military age to be on the draft rolls, which America does that too, right? When you sign up to get 
federal aid for college, they conveniently sign you up for the draft at 18. Praise the Lord. And he wanted to do a draft. This was not popular, as you can imagine. Uh, it, drafts aren't super popular even to today. But David sends Joab out, and Joab cheats a little, as we see in one of the passages. This story is told twice, in Chronicles and in Samuel. He doesn't count the Levites, which they wouldn't have probably been allowed to go to war anyways. And he doesn't count Benjamin either. He, uh, he's trying to circumvent the king's command, which is ironic because Joab had also had some of his failings, right? If we look at his life story, he'd made a few mistakes in his time as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what Mrs. White tells us, that David was trying to, he got in a little self-important, self-confidence. I, boy, we build this army, we're going to go and slap some people around, because we're tough. We're bad hombres, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> could have done the same thing because he had all these fortified cities, but he knew he couldn't. He knew he was in trouble. <laughs> David realizes before the census is even finished, according to Mrs. White, that he goofed up. And he says, whoops. And he says, I've sinned greatly by doing this. And he asks us for forgiveness. But interestingly, God responds with three choices, which seem rather harsh, considering that it was David who sinned, right? What do the people have to do with this? Absolutely. Absolutely, that's what Mrs. White says. That while they didn't like the draft, they also had a little, yeah, we're, we're tough. Israel is, we're bad business. Anybody wants to mess with us, we're going we're gonna to mess them up. They had the same thoughts in their head as King David. Well, under David, they were beating up on everybody else. Okay. For a little while, but well, In our mind, it's a little while, but for them, it was 30, 40 years oh, wow. of victory. Yeah. And so they had gotten a little excited about what they could do. And so he's given three choices. Famine, three months of defeated by their enemies, or three days of plague by the Lord. David doesn't want to be in the hands of his enemies. And I imagine he didn't want a famine either, watching women and children and others starving to death for three whole years. So he asks to be in the hands of God. 70,000 men fall dead as punishment for their pride and arrogance, along with David's. And David is so distraught, I think most of this time he's begging for forgiveness. But eventually we see the angel of the Lord... Standing on Mount Moriah, this scripture doesn't specifically mention it, but this is the mountain that he's on, the same one where Abraham takes Isaac to for that classic scene. David sees this and he rushes over there. Actually, he's told by the prophet what to do. He goes there, the guy that owns Mount Moriah at this point, or this portion of Mount Moriah anyways, offers to give it to him. Here, take the oxen, because I'm sure he wants the plague to end too. And he probably, when he finds out that's what God wants, he wants the plague to be done. He probably believes in God as well. But David says, no, I will not sacrifice something I haven't paid for. So he buys the spot. I'm sure there was some of that, yes. He buys the spot, 
And he buys the sacrifice, and God responds with fire from heaven to say that the plague was over. So we're seeing this tension, right, between trusting in God, Jonathan, David's best friend, right? Two guys heading out to fight a whole army and trusting ourselves and our mighty army on the other side. And there's this tension that Jehoshaphat had to deal with too, right? Of preparing to protect what God had given him to protect, but also recognizing that it's God's and he needs to protect it ultimately, doesn't he? And so Jehoshaphat lifts it to God and David as well after a mistake. You know, it's interesting if you read the the Mrs. White's references on this passion. She says, David is one of the most well-trained men to handle power. And yet we see that David made significant mistakes, didn't he? But his early training was specifically designed by God to keep him from making a lot of mistakes as king. Because the old saying that we all have, right, absolute power corrupts absolutely. God knows that too. Which is why he trains these kings to follow him and obey. Because he knows this power that they're given will so easily corrupt them. Same for us. The power we're given can easily corrupt us. The things we are given can easily corrupt us. Jehoshaphat made mistakes, but throughout we see a consistent desire to serve God. The same thing for David, and God blessed both of their reigns tremendously. David takes this Mount Moriah. It was a very vivid experience in his mind at the end of his reign, right? This angel of the Lord standing with a sword. Eventually the sword is not drawn anymore because God tells him to stop over Jerusalem. But this giant angel standing over Mount Moriah is vividly implanted in his mind and now he owns Mount Moriah. And so in the last few years of his reign, he begins to prepare everything he's collected to build the temple. And the temple is going to go right there on Mount Moriah. And he tells his son, Solomon, I'm collecting all this stuff for you. We've got all these things. We're making nails. We're collecting wood and gold and silver. And he said, I can't build the temple because I've shed blood. Or actually, God told him, you can't build the temple because you've shed a lot of blood. But your son will. And so Solomon builds the temple right there on Mount Moriah. Interesting. Sorry, Joe, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say. I agree with that. I think sometimes he, he intervenes in subtle ways. And, ooh, before I forget. And I, I think a lot of times we write it off, right? Like, okay, you get really, really sick, and then you take some medicine. And you say, oh, good, the medicine worked. But you also prayed, right? <laughs> Lord, this, is, this, this thing is brutal. Can you help me out? So whether God gave your doctor the idea to give you that medicine or he healed you himself, we need to stop a moment and think, thank you, Lord, I'm feeling better. But so often we're like, oh, the medicine failed me better. Or, well, I don't know how many of you have given a talk or a sermon or something. If it goes poorly, this has happened to me, if it goes poorly, you think to yourself, Lord, where were you? Man, this sermon was a dud. It fell flat. You look at the other people. They're just over there. When is he done? And you think to yourself, wow, this fell flat. God, where were you? But when it goes good, what's our immediate? Boy, I did good. I researched the right stuff. That story was amazing. That worked really good. Boom, boom, boom. And you have to stop yourself and think, well, wait a second. How come God gets the blame when it goes bad, but I get the glory when it goes good? Right? Yeah. Hmm. yeah, that daily surrender is very important. 
Jesus tells us, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so that daily surrender is important because every morning I wake up with my selfishness, my wickedness, trying to reassert control. And that daily surrender to God, and even more than, than once, maybe some of you can do it once and it sticks longer, but I have challenges some days where it needs to be more than once. <laughs> Because my heart is always trying to do what it wants to do. It's always headed in the wrong direction. Romans 7. I do what I don't want to do. And what I do, I don't do. Yeah, Romans 7 is a very uplifting passage if you've ever struggled with addiction, which I think most of us have in some form or another. Maybe not to gambling or, or some drug, but some, something, some habit Maybe that's a better word. Some habit that you just can't let go of. And Romans 7 is uplifting to realize that the Apostle Paul struggled with it too. So I think the, the lesson that's being driven home here is that the trust in self and self confidence can get us in trouble. Now don't get me wrong, you can go too far the other way. And you can depress yourself by focusing on how evil you are, how wicked you are. You need to recognize that, that there's nothing good in our hearts. Romans 3, there's no one good, no one one. But if you stay there <clears throat> in this dark thought that I'm an awful, awful person, and I'm so mean and ugly, and you basically start all this negative talk to yourself, you are going to get very discouraged. You need to recognize, I've sinned. I have no confidence in my own ability to obey God and surrender that to him. But then you need to also trust in God's love. Because if you focus on the negatives of yourself, you get discouraged and you begin to doubt that God loves you. How could God love me? How, look, look how bad I am. And we need to transition from, yes, I'm wicked. Yes, I've let God down countless times. And transition to the thought, but Jesus died on the cross for me. Because he loves me. And he knew when he went to the cross exactly what I was going to do. And he loved me anyways. And so... Going from that thought to how we interact with the physical, financial, structural world, whether we're rich or whether we're poor or in between, the important part is where God is in the hierarchy of our life. Jehoshaphat made a few mistakes, yes, but when the crunch time came, he put God first. He had the army. He had the fort. He had the financial security. He had everything built up around his empire. And we all have our own little nest egg or empire, financially or otherwise. And he had structured everything he could to protect it. But then in the moment when it mattered, he gave it to God and said, God, these are your people. This is what you've given us. This is what you've given me. We need you to protect it. And God did. Mark 12 tells us what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And we've heard these before, but when we really think about putting those into practice, it's a life pursuit, is it not? To love your God with that much commitment? And to love your neighbor when you don't even like them? Because they're loud, their dog's barking all the time, they steal from you. I'm just referencing some of my neighbors. Maybe yours are better than mine, but <clears throat> that's why I moved to the country. No, sorry. Anyways, uh, I did have some challenging neighbors, that's for sure. But not just your neighbors, your coworkers, your family, right? Your family gets on your nerves like nobody's business. Why? Because they know where all the buttons are because they've been poking you since they were little and they, they found the right ones and they just keep pushing those buttons. 
Love your neighbor, love your friends, love your family, love your church family. Maybe the church family pushes your buttons too or says something that gets under your skin. And we're like a real family. We're here because God's the Father and we're a family and we have to stick it out through those little annoyances and the little button pushing that we do to each other, don't we? Because we're a family. 1 John 2.15, as my time is wrapping up here, says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boastings of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Keep our eyes on God and his love for us. And we know from Daniel 12 and Revelation 13, and our time is gone, so I'm just going to reference them. You can look at them later. That there is a time of trouble coming. Is it now? We don't know. Seventh day Adventists have gone through financial crises before, right? The Great Depression. Some of your grandparents maybe were around for that. Mine were a little on the young side, but. I think they lived through some of it. The Great Depression, two world wars, Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, on and on and on. Wars, financial crisis, the 70s with the lines for gas, right? Now we have another hiccup with the banking system. We had the collapse in 08 of the the financial bubble that burst with housing and other things. And so our desire is to squeeze a little tighter because, oh boy, is my money safe? Can I feed my family? Am I going to lose my house? Is my car going to get repossessed? Real problems, right, that we talk to God about. But God tells us in the beginning, right? Do not worry about tomorrow, for today has enough trouble of its own, and put your trust in me. And whether the time of the end is tomorrow, and this is just the beginning, or it's 10 years away, or 20 or 30, our time of of commitment to God is here and now. Because no one is guaranteed that their time of trouble isn't coming sooner than we think. I'd like to think, you know, my heart's strong, I'm in good health. I got another, what, 40 years at least, come on. I already have two classmates from high school that are dead. A 35-year-old woman who passed away with a two-year-old daughter. And I hadn't talked to her for a long time, but that struck me hard because at that time my kids were about that age too, or at least one of them was. And to leave them behind at such a young age. She was cancer. There was nothing she could have done to stop it. And so we're not guaranteed that next day. We work like Jehoshaphat did to protect our family. He was protecting his very big extended family, right? The tribe of Judah. And we do the same thing. We work to take care of them, to feed them, to house them, to clothe them. But God needs to be first, like Jehoshaphat put him first. And that's true for me and that's true for you, whether I have another 10 years, hopefully, I kind of ask God to get, get me through long enough until my girls are old enough to take care of themselves. But, and it's up to him. But God needs to be first, whether we have a lot or a little. And tithe, as Deuteronomy 14 tells us, is a part of that. It's a constant reminder for me. And I've heard Dwight Nelson talking about this, and it really struck a chord with me. It's a constant reminder to fight against my own selfish greed. Every time I write that tithe check, my offering check, it's fighting against my selfish greed that I want to cling to that money. I need it. I've got plans for it. We've got to take care of this. We've got to fix that. I need it. And yet, when I write that check, it's putting God first, and it's fighting my selfish greed in my heart. And that's why God instituted it. Not because God needs the money. God doesn't even need an army, right? Two guys? 
Boom, gone. No guys. Boom, gone for Jehoshaphat. He just had a choir, a bunch of guys out there singing to the Lord, and boom, gone. God doesn't need an army. He doesn't need a budget to make things work. But he needs my heart to fight against my own selfishness. And he uses certain tools to do that. And so this morning, as we seek to grow closer to God and that revival, I encourage you to, to think about tithe and offerings in that manner. Maybe it'll help you not feel so depressed about it if you do. I don't know what your feelings are, but it fights against our own greed in our hearts. And it's a gift from God to do that. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we recognize our own helplessness, selfishness, wickedness, greed, anger, frustration. You name it, we've got it. <clears throat> but Lord, we surrender all this to you. We can't fix ourselves. We can't fix anything, Lord. But we trust that a loving God who came running when we needed the mercy and the love and died for us can fix it. And Lord, you've given us examples in the Bible of you fixing it. So Lord, this morning, we can't even change our desire for you. We can't change how much we want to surrender to you. But this morning, we can choose who we will serve. And so Lord, despite the coldness of our hearts and the wickedness and the desires for all sorts of things and the lack of, of desire to love you or serve you, we choose you, Father. Bring revival into our hearts. Bring revival into our church, Father, that we will commit to you. We are so helpless, so unable to do any of these things, but we recognize, as Jehoshaphat did, you have the power and the might to do it all. So, Father, this morning, may our hearts be open to you, and may you work in amazing and powerful ways in our church here in Chowchilla and in our school. In Jesus' name, amen.